reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Ten o'clock Saturday night. That was the woke that was. We've got Pete Barnes, we've got Lois Perry, and we've got the author of Gender Madness, Ollie. Okay, good morning, and uh, this is a special edition of our 9.30 Kevin Alex show. She's Alex Phillips, uh, I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. Uh, we are going to throttle through the headlines uh, at a real rate of knots very, very quickly. Uh, this is the fastest show in broadcasting, so let's get going. A lot. I didn't get to do my little ad. Okay, here. sorry, sorry. Oh, go, go, oh, go. Do is it. Is that why it's a special what? show? Because you're shutting down the comedy element that I, I donate to this half hour. No, I'm shutting down your element. I don't think you need the word <laughs> comedy. Well, I was just going to say. <laughs> Come on, then. Go on, then. Go on. We're grappling with the headlines like two decrepit Mexican wrestlers in the lucha libre. Racist. That was going to be today's. That's racist. That's racist against Mexicans. I'm very, very sorry. Uh, no, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> You got mad today, Kev. You're balmy. Yeah, well, it's comedy, on? isn't it? Comedy, isn't it? Uh, right, let's get going. It's no uh, no laughing matter. God, that was good, wasn't it? For Angela Not Rayner. Uh, uh, the police are now investigating multiple allegations. For some sort of reason I can't work out, Fleet Street newspapers seem to have forgotten that when this story broke about a month ago, uh, there were two elements to it. One was electoral fraud. In other words, you have to register your correct address. And if it turns out you were living somewhere else... Uh, that's an offence. It's a fairly minor offence. Uh, the real problem for her was uh, she said she was living at one house and not living in another. And in that respect, uh, she is accused of allegedly uh, avoiding, evading capital gains tax to the tune of about 1,500 quid. That's the main point. Uh, it looks as if there may be other tax elements involved. Mm. But for some reason, the newspapers seem to have forgotten uh, that there was a tax element from day one. They say she's not just being investigated for electoral fraud. Well, she never was just being elect investigated for electoral fraud, so I think we're with the programme, but it does look as if uh, it's a very serious investigation. They say it will take weeks. There are at least 11 detectives working on this. This is a serious investigation, and uh, the head of Manchester Police said there are a lot of allegations uh, knocking around, and sources in Manchester Police say uh, that it is only right that this is investigated very thoroughly because it is in the public interest. Uh, Angela Rayner, I would suggest, uh, is not sleeping well at night right now. Oh, really? I don't think she probably cares. But what I don't well, understand what, the is end the of person her career? who seems to care the least of all is Sir Keir Starmer. Why would she care? He's back. Well, no, I think she's just, she's, she's ballsy like that. I think she just thinks she'll get over and it'll be fine and it's nothing. No, I think she's... I think I she think, probably... Think, she's looking at the end of her career. I, I think she probably think cares. She I, I don't think she is, and I think she thinks she'll just uh, get away with it scot-free. I don't think she thinks there'll be any consequences to Sir Keir Starmer certainly doesn't seem to think so, although he has yes, said he, he does. doesn't need to... Yes, he does. What are you talking about? Keir, do you Keir Starmer today? won't get involved. He will not look at that yeah. uh, alleged uh, letter that That's she has from experts. Saying. So he is uh, key, uh, maintaining uh, plausible deniability. He wants to be able to deny that he knew anything about it. Keir Starmer is not helping her one bit. Uh, he is worried, she's worried, uh, and this is a very thorough police investigation. Uh, I, I, I think you're a bit off beam if you say she doesn't care, because if she doesn't care, oh, no. there's, there's something wrong with her. <laughs> 
I'm off beam. OK. Right, next story, then. <laughs> <laughs> That's put her in her place. Right, let's get going. Uh, uh, Sunak's smoking ban. Uh, that passed, of course, last night with the help of Labour uh, in uh, the House of Commons. Uh, but uh, several uh, cabinet ministers voted against it, including uh, Kemi Badenoch. Uh, and uh, this, I think, was a bad day for freedom of choice, uh, or for a bad day for liberty. And what is a Tory government doing uh, cracking down on our freedom of choice like this, do you think, Alex? Well, I don't know, signing a death wish, not that they need to do that. Uh, but it seems to me that it's going to get through Parliament anyway. There's well, it enough is, for them it's through to, Parliament. Well, yeah, it's, it? well, it's going to go to the Lords and be bounced around, but it's going to become law pretty quickly, isn't it? Um, I mean, I just think, I'm with bad on this, which is how on earth is this going to be enforced? It's all very well saying 15-year-olds can't buy cigarettes now, they can't legally anyway, but when those people are then 30 and 40 and, you know, the sliding scale goes up and their friend who's 40 years old plus one can buy cigarettes and they can't well you're still showing id every yeah. single person buying cigarettes having to like get out the old driving license and prove their date of birth it's really mad it just yeah. doesn't make sense well here's something you won't hear from me very often i agree with liz trust here's liz uh putting in her two penneth in the commons yesterday but the problem is the but the problem is the instinct of this establishment and which is reflected by a cross-party consensus today in today's chamber, is to believe that they, that the government, are better at making decisions for people than people themselves. And I absolutely agree that that is true for the under-18s. It is very important, until people have decision-making capability while they are growing up, that we protect them. But I think the whole idea that we can protect adults from themselves is hugely problematic. Uh, yeah, she caught, accused the government of uh, control freakery and nannery, nanny statism, uh, quite rightly too. I mean, you know, smoking is bad for you, try not to do it, kids. But it's, it's not the government's job to tell us whether or not we can indulge in legal activities, don't you think? I mean, I just think on this one, it just it, the enforcement of this, I'd rather the government just went, right, we're going to ban smoking outright and, you know, stick their head over the power a bit and do that than try and, like, fudge this sort of weird uh, hodgepodge of legislation, which is going to sort of see a particular cut-off point that sort of follows people throughout their lives. It's that that, to me, just doesn't make sense. If smoking is the big evil and you want to be a nanny state, just ban the lot of it or don't. Yeah. This well, is, you know, you can't because otherwise, basically, what you've got is a law for one person and not for another. Yeah. So if you're born one day ahead of someone else, you get to smoke yeah. for the rest of your life. And if you happen to be born 24 hours later, you don't. And law's supposed to be completely unilateral. It's supposed to cover absolutely everybody in the same way. So that's my big issue with this. I mean, I think banning smoking is massive overreach, but you know, that's the 21st century. Very regional areas. Sunak thinks it's his legacy. He'll be remembered as the Prime Minister who turned Britain smoke free. No, you won't, Rishi. You'll, won't be, you'll be rem remembered as the Prime Minister who uh, put a rocket up the illegal cigarette uh, industry's <laughs> backside. Uh, they'll be trading in illegal cigarettes, and uh, kids uh, who I were born know, after 2008 will smoke. It that's won't suggesting work. suggesting that Rishi Sunak's going to be remembered full stop. I reckon quiz night 2048. When yeah. People say who was Prime Minister yeah. in 2024. Everyone will be spatting their heads going, who was that guy again? Uh, the question is, who was the second worst Prime Minister ever? The first being Liz Truss. Uh, now, uh, it's still with the nanny state. Still with the nanny state. Uh, doctors are now calling. Uh, it's already illegal, ridiculously, in my view, in Scotland. Uh, smacking mm. your kids. Uh, now doctors are demanding that it's made illegal in England and Northern Ireland. I think it might be illegal already in Wales. So Scotland and Wales, you can't hit your kids. In England and Northern <laughs> Ireland, you can. Uh, the point is... You know, I mean, nobody hitting kids isn't very nice. Uh, you know, I'm of a certain age, you might have noticed that uh, I got hit almost every day by some kind of adult when I was a kid. My parent, my mother, my father, the local copper, teachers, the headmaster, all the time we Blimey, were hit. If you're an advert for what turns, you know, what yeah, exactly. children who get smacked so, turn so, into. So we must ban smacking, <laughs> otherwise, everyone will turn out like me. <laughs> That's no, what I'm worried about now. No, but it's, I don't think teachers should smack, smack no. kids or anything like that. But, but the pa parents should. Surely, yeah, it's nothing there's, to do with the government. Well, there's legislation in place. You can't beat a child because that would cause them physical harm, and therefore you no, no, end no, up in a police station. Similarly, in school, corporal punishment has not existed in 
in schools for a very long time. It's been banished from the education system. Mm. The thing is with this is if you've got a kid and is, you know, being mad and running around a supermarket and about to snatch, I don't know, kitchen knife off the shelf and you go and grab them, reprimand them and give them a little whack because they're not listening, then someone else could report you to the cops. That to me seems utterly ridiculous. I think, you know, there's a big difference between physically beating up a child and really hurting yeah. a child yeah, yeah, and a yeah, quick yeah. tap because children are a bit like pets, aren't That's they? Really they don't have their, their faculties and legislation covers the protection of children already. That's a really good point. I, well, going back to my tortured childhood, it wasn't tortured, it was a very happy childhood. I got smacked a lot because the kids did get smacked a lot then, but I was never beaten. I yeah. was never beaten. I was just smacked and reprimanded and a lot of parents have said, look, if my kid is running towards the M4 motorway mm. uh, and I'm trying to persuade my kid not to do such things, a little tap on the back mm. of the legs uh, will emphasise you your know point. What? All these all these millennials who got sat on the naughty step by yeah. Super Nanny, look what they've turned into, snowflakes, the lot of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, get out of our lives. Stop bringing in laws. When did doctors yeah. in the country, they've gone mad since COVID, haven't they? Yeah. They're just all over it, everything. Freedom for the individual over the state is as simple as that. The, the state doesn't bring up kids, uh, so uh, let us uh, continue. Uh, I'm going to leave this one to you because you like the subject of Lord Cameron. What is the story? Oh, Lord Spadeface of Sheeping Norton, my favourite. <laughs> uh, well, he's uh, bimbling off to Israel today to have various meetings with his counterpart, he's just, Israel. Just oh, he's just landed. just landed. There you go. Lucky you, Israel. Lucky Israel. Lucky Israel. you. Uh, he'll be meeting uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, of course, the Foreign Minister Israel Katz, and probably War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz. And he's going to say to them, listen here, you, don't do anything about Iran trying to bomb your country. Have you seen the size of some of those massive missiles that they found yeah. sort of landed over Jordan that got intercepted? That Iran was 30 sending cruise over. missiles. These things 30. were not little, sort of, you know, they weren't party poppers. Cruise missiles. These were big boys. They they meant to do serious yeah. harm. And yeah. if Iran thinks they've got gotten away with it, I think they've got another yeah. thing coming. And yeah. I just hope that whatever Cameron is saying out loud to the press to sort of appease the international community and say, now, now, Israel, don't retaliate. Behind the scenes, I'm hoping yeah. he's saying, look, if you do uh, disciplined, strategic, you yeah. know, military interventions, go into Iran, get rid of their yeah. uranium, whatever they are, proliferators, and, new, new and target their Target, evil yeah. Kuds force general to fund and yeah. resource and arm all these terrorists, then yeah, I hope that behind the scenes we're saying to Israel, do what you need to do and we're going to be here for you. I'll tell you what I hope. Uh, I hope that uh, Netanyahu tells uh, Cameron, as you said, among the, uh, there were more than 300 bombs and missiles fired at Israel on Saturday night, was it at the weekend, right? Mm. Among them, as you quite rightly say, it were 30 cruise missiles. These are among the most deadly massive weapons in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they ima playing. Im imagine, imagine if 30 cruise missiles were fired at London uh, by a foreign state. Uh, do you think that we would show restraint? Right. And if I was Benjamin Netanyahu, I would say to Cameron, how dare you tell me not to respond? I'm going to respond. Also, I think Israel yeah. should respond. Also, people like CNN are saying, well, we've got to keep the diplomatic channels open and negotiate with Iran. You can't negotiate with Iran. They're not they're a theocratic regime who don't give a flying anything yeah. about what the rest of the world <laughs> thinks. They're rogue pariah states. They proved that on Saturday. You can't sit around the negotiating table with them. Here they are now, willy-wanging over what weapons they've got. Yeah, suggesting they, what they've th got the big ones. Yeah, what they're threatening is say if Israel retaliates, uh, we will hit Israel with an, a, a weapon that no one knows about. Uh, we're assuming that could be a nuclear mm. weapon. Uh, but either way, it could be just a load of BS from Iran, which likes to pretend it's incredibly powerful militarily, but isn't really. What I don't get is they've actually turned away now the uh, UN uh, international nuclear inspectors, the weapons inspectors, is supposed to go around and say, like, you know, are you making a nuclear weapon? No, you're not. OK, fine. But um, you, th th they've turned these people away. We've been saying for ages, people in intelligence, well, they might be a month away from having a nuclear weapon about a month ago. They're getting all the widgets and bits and bobbins from China and Russia. And now what? We're just going to sit there and try and negotiate with them. You're having a giraffe. Yeah, exactly. Saddam didn't even have weapons of mass right. destruction. We went in there. Just to remind us of what this is all about, uh, a uh, survivor 
of the Nova Festival attack. You remember that when Hamas ran into that rock festival and put, shot loads of people dead, uh, bringing terror to that event, and they all had to run for their lives, literally for 15 miles as they were chased. Oh, well, uh, one of the survivors, happens. a guy called Guy Ben Shimon, uh, he's been speaking to the Israeli parliament and he said since that event, I mean, we don't know the veracity of it, but I don't know why he would lie. He said uh, that since that event, uh, nearly 50 traumatised Israeli revellers who survived that event have, have killed themselves. Have it's extraordinary. Suicide. So let's, let, let's always remember what this is about. Mm. Let's always remember October the 7th because a lot of people seem to be forgetting. Forget, and they forget actually this wasn't just going in there with assault rifles like that wasn't bad enough. They maimed those bodies. They yeah, did unspeakable yeah. things to the, to women, the bodies. Yeah, yeah. They cut bits and bobs off those bodies. They act like utterly depraved medieval animals. I mean I've, I've never seen anything like it in my life. Um, and this is what the, the Iran backing uh, Hamas and Houthis and Hezbollah want to do to Israel. And what we're just saying, like, oh, please show restraint. Come OK, on. let's uh, move on to Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump's on trial in uh, New York. Uh, it's the hush money trial in which he paid... Uh, is accused of paying $130,000 to the porn star Stormy Daniels to keep their alleged affair secret. Uh, he denies that there was ever an affair, uh, but is accused of electoral manipulation because uh, hiding up that story, they say, New York says, affected the result of the yeah. presidential election in 2016. Uh, the, uh, the Donald has been banned from campaigning during this trial, uh, but frankly is campaigning every day. Let's have a listen to what he had to say as he arrived at court yesterday. We are going to uh, continue. We are going to uh, continue our fight against this judge. We think he's totally conflicted. He's a conflicted judge, as you know. We're an appeal. Uh, I there has ever been a judge more conflicted than this one. So we'll see how that all works out. Are you worried about having a hard time? We're having a hard time with the New York State system. It's under watch by the whole world, and uh, it's not looking very good. Well, what's fascinating about this is Donald Trump has effectively been gagged. He's not allowed to say anything about the jury, not allowed to say anything about the judge, not allowed to say anything about relatives. Hello. Well, no, Hello. this is it. <laughs> Has. And people are already calling for him to be fined as a result of that. And he's pointed out quite rightly, you know, you've got this decrepit old fossil who's going about failing to campaign because he can't even remember his own name. Meanwhile, he should be out in Minnesota and Delaware, you know, uh, pounding the pavements and meeting people and having these big rallies and laying out his case ahead of the next election. Instead, they've holed him up in court. Yeah, well, it's a deliberate a bit of, of lawfare. I mean, you know, uh, Donald Trump says this is a political move by a Democrat city, and frankly, it, uh, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. So let's move on, uh, Harry and Meghan. Now, first of all, shocking, shocking revelations that the 50 jars of strawberry jam that was sent to various VIPs from Meghan's uh, American Riviera Orchard uh, lifestyle website were actually made by the Duchess of Sussex herself. Wow. So astonishing! Oh my astonishing. god, woman's talents never end. I bet she even did the calligraphy on the label. Megan, you're oh. so talented. Well Megan. done, really Megan. Oh, I mean, I, I, oh I, 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 she, I've given I'm her a just, hard time. Oh, in, I know it's all in changed the past, me now. But it's all, it's all changed, changed for now. Me now. That is, that's astonishing prowess, actually um, making some jam. Who knew the delicate Duchess's fingers could pick her own fruits and hold a wooden spoon and stir yeah, a cauldron? Yeah. I mean, you can, she, she way, can do that. By the way, I bet she didn't make them. Uh, also, uh, her their former aide, uh, their main uh, sort of. Uh, uh, person who worked for them, uh, Samantha, she was named, known as Samantha the Panther Cohen. She worked for the Queen for a long time. Long time. And when mm. Meghan came into the family and married uh, Harry, the Queen said, would you mind going yeah, and work, work for the Sussexes? Well, she quit, she managed to stick on for about, uh, for a few months. months for 18 yeah. months, but she quit as soon as she could. She said that working for them was like working for teenagers. Mm. And then afterwards, they really struggled to find a replacement for her. And when they finally <laughs> found one, that she replacement quit. quit on yeah. the first tour, that notorious 
notorious tour of Africa well, where Meghan started slagging off the royal family. It all goes back to these bullying claims. Was it Jason Nauf, who was the uh, communications guy, who said that Meghan would deliberately single out and target a different woman each time to undermine, to manipulate, to blackmail, yes, to emotionally yes. abuse. I don't think anyone's saying that Meghan was the sort of shouting boss, although we have heard a few well, suggestions. I think they are, <laughs> Well, no, but what, what's being suggested, certainly in what Nauf has said to various people, is that she was just deeply spiteful and manipulative and undermining and unkind. And, of course, there was that big uh, bullying report, wasn't there, by the palace a couple of days before yeah. the Oprah interview. We never saw we that, never, did we? We never know what verdict yeah. was. We, uh, we assumed it was very damning about the Sussexes, yeah. but it never got published, and that was a mistake by yeah, the Queen. Yeah, exactly. She commissioned an independent investigation into the Sussexes' mm -hmm. behaviour with staff, uh, and it was never published, and we assume, because it wasn't very complimentary about Harry and Meghan. Uh, right. But uh, let's move on a big story today on, on the financial front you take it away uk inflation uh, falls to 3.2 percent that means things are only going to get more expensive <laughs> by 3.2 percent every year well great i mean it's a bit better than a million percent or whatever year about, you know yeah. about middle of the energy crisis but the government will say well this is our plan working inflation is now Nothing falling faster really than expected it isn't to do with you this was all about supply chains and country support this is all the post pandemic overheating of the market yeah. because yeah. the bank of england and printed loads of excess money and just shoved it into an economy that wasn't even functioning. And this is all to do with the big energy crisis. And when you look at our energy bills still and compare them to those in Europe, in America, in Japan, we're paying extortionate amounts because we've always had a rubbish energy policy across successive governments. So I don't think people are sitting there going, that's it, brilliant. We can all afford to go on holiday and eat caviar now. I don't think so. Well, Andrew Bailey, the second-rate uh, governor of the Bank of England, he says that this may trigger uh, a... Uh, uh, interest rate cut uh, <gasps> if, if that happens let us know well when you're going to do it Andrew let us know don't say you're thinking about it just do it because cutting interest rates isn't your strong suit is it uh, or adding to interest rates just getting either it right in yeah, general. If, you'd have, yeah. if you'd have done something about our interest rates two years ago in other words put them up a bit we probably wouldn't be in this economic mess now uh, America did it and America is economically flying uh, we are in the toilet. So thank you, Mr. Bailey. Uh, but anyway, move on. Uh, this is an extraordinary... This is extraordinary. It's raining in Dubai. And not only is it raining in that desert uh, city, mm. it is peeing down. Uh, they yeah. are being flooded. I think we've got lots of interesting... Uh, footage. <laughs> you but do you know what's being discussed? No, Sorry, it's crazy. Shouldn't but, laugh. No, the floodwaters become so intense, it's actually smashing the windows of shopping malls. Apparently, there's designer clothes look bobbing down this, the street. But also, all the people with their big fancy cars have found out, much to everyone's surprise, that everything else doesn't float apart from Teslas. Yeah, Apparently, uh, Teslas, Teslas float. Teslas float. <laughs> so people with Teslas are around going around Dubai like they're in Venice or something. That's extraordinary. But, um, and apparently, the weather is not going to let up. A load of people had to flee properties and were camped out sleeping in the airport and yeah. flights couldn't land and it's just not what you expect from the Middle East is it those no, sorts of scenes I feel very sorry for the people for the Brits in fact everyone who's gone out there on holiday guaranteed oh, yeah, right, burning yeah. sunshine in Dubai not this time <laughs> the airport is in absolute chaos thousands of people completely stuck there uh, so this is probably a once in a generation event I cannot remember ever seeing flooding in Dubai before well, I think the last time that happened Noah built an ark yeah. um, so no it is it's, it's quite extraordinary scenes. Although so imagine all those poor, inst what they called yeah. influencers, yeah. who can't pout on them yeah. and gurn into the cameras. I tell you, I don't know about Dubai, oh, Dubai but uh, you know, I, I don't know if I ever told you. I used to live in Los Angeles. When it rained there, <laughs> when Did it you? rained there, all the buildings are not built for rain. So you'd be in a mm. hotel foyer or something, and it's absolutely pouring through the roof, yeah. buckets everywhere. So these buildings in uh, areas with hot climates, they don't send tend to be yeah. uh, prepared for this kind of deluge. They probably don't have storm sewers, and the ground that the rain's falling on is pretty hard. It's not like they've got all this lovely yeah, that's farmland it. That's to exactly soak up it. all of the wet either. That so is exactly pretty, it. Pretty, pretty chaotic out there, it seems. Now, here's another extraordinary story. This is the way they take our money and completely waste it. The House of Lords <laughs> has quietly admitted uh, it is spending £840,000 a year on a team of health and safety traffic marshals. And this is for a tiny little one-way system for the chauffeur-driven cars that go into the Palace of Westminster. So these traffic marshals cost 
us, the taxpayer, £840,000 a year mm. just so that lords well, can park their cars. What is mad? You could probably stick up a few signs and say, well, it's a bit like a multi-storey car park. Just follow the signs. But, oh, no, they've got to have these marshals. And what is staggering is if you break down the amount of money, each traffic marshal in their high-vis vest pointing in a you oh, know, yeah. certain direction is getting £93,000. I want to be a traffic marshal. Uh, uh, just That's get, great. I mean, it is ridiculous <laughs> the amount of money that uh, our authorities waste on this kind of thing. It is an absolute scandal, uh, really. Yeah. 90... £93,000 to, to, to sort of direct traffic. We need some traffic. You can stick some signs up. Uh, as our producer Ryan has just said, they all need a smack. They do. <laughs> Naughty. Well, it uh, is ridiculous. It is. Uh, but uh, anyway, I uh, must go down and check that out in Parliament. Uh, now, uh, we have to talk about um, how much you reckon your house is worth. Well, well, I don't. You, you I, rent well, I it, rent. Don't you? I rent. I don't even want to say how much it's worth because the amount I'm paying in rent is ridiculous. But if I wanted right. to buy my decrepit old little tiny two-bedroom bolt hole in London, I think actually genuinely it's worth something like one point seven million, which is mad because okay. that's London prices. Not that I can afford that. Hence, being a renter until I'm seventy years old and can move under a motorway bridge in Macats. Well, look, uh, my my house is it's up in Hampstead. It's worth a few quid. Uh, so I'm thinking of selling it. I'm thinking of uh, relocating. I'm going to move to Paris, near Paris. I'm going to buy the uh, Chateau uh, de Mainville. Uh, and uh, that, there it is. There it is. Now that, ladies, right, and, ge that, ladies nice and gentlemen, is the most expensive house in the entire world. Uh, yours for just £363 million. Pounds. Yeah, it used to belong to the King of Morocco. That gaff did. Yeah. I'm thinking, Kev, once we uh, <laughs> finish uh, you know, our, our good run of the last six months yeah. at the end of this week, should we go there and just sort of like enforce squatters' rights? They won't even find us, actually. We could just go find, have a different wing of the house each, and it'll take 20 years for someone to discover we're, we're in there. You're, you're putting me down a bit financially, yeah, Alex. I think I could probably raise a mortgage for this. Well, uh, that you could have done before you had to pay that tax bill, remember? Yeah, actually. <laughs> I know, 35 and to, all that. Come to think. <laughs> Come to think of we all we right. all know about that tax. Right, bill. further here's some more expensive houses. This is the most expensive house in America. That I believe that's shite. in Florida that's in Florida. That looks rubbish. Uh, that? And I it's 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 worth how much? Two hundred and ninety three million dollars? Two hundred and ninety five million dollars. Now the guy yeah. who owns it uh, was flying over this place, Naples, Florida, which is the <laughs> west coast of Florida, was flying over it. He saw this sort of waste ground and thought mm. by the scene he thought that looks like a nice plot of land. So he paid a million dollars for it. Right. And he built this. Uh, it has entertained presidents, Clinton, uh, Bush. That's they've it. all been there. Uh, I think it looks like and, a detention centre. Yeah, I don't it, like it doesn't look that great, but it's too... Well, from an aerial view, it's like a detention centre. Yours center. for 293 yeah, million. No pounds. Uh, there's another one uh, we were going to show a picture of, but it's, it's in Regent's Park. And how much is that one worth? That's a 250 million quid, I think. 250 million, million quid. quid. That's start. a big mansion. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm going to make a choice. I don't know which one, but I think probably the Chateau d'Armain Villiers is for me. Yeah, no, I like, uh, I like plants. Bit of a francophile. Million quid. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable that any house could be worth that much. I wonder how much the King of Morocco got for it when he flogged it. Uh, but either way, uh, that is the world of super expensive property for you. We are going to have another look at some of these stories later on. But sadly, Alex, I think we've come to the end we of this have show. Indeed, it's been an enjoyable romp through the stories. Come back at one o'clock and we'll do it all again on Cross Talk. Talk. Julia Hartley Brewer is next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, uh, there was a suggestion by some.